Hello, my fellow cell members. Uh, welcome to this, the final teaching of the liturgical year. Uh, it is November. We have been uh, exploring vaguely the theme of pilgrimage and conversion, and we're going to uh, finish that theme today. Uh, all pilgrimages reach their end, finally, either Canterbury or Santiago. Uh, and the church's year reaches its end. Next time we meet, it will be Advent. Uh, and on a larger scale, everything will have its end. Uh, and so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what the church calls eschatology, the end things. And we touched on this uh, in an allegorical way uh, a few teachings ago when we uh, explored Dante's Divine Comedy. Uh, which, and uh, I thought, uh, I would try in as light-hearted a way as possible to deal with the same subject, but in terms of what the church teaches us um, about what will happen at the uh, at the end of our lives. Um, and so I wanted to start, uh, but not dwell too long, uh, on the worst bit. First, uh, we have this concept of uh, hell, uh, and we find it uh, referred to uh, by Jesus in the Gospels, he refers to a place called Gehenna, uh, a few places. I thought I would uh, pick one in Matthew uh, chapter 13, verse 40. Just as the weeds are collected and burned up with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will collect out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all evildoers, and they will throw them into the furnace of fire where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. So he used the word Gehenna, which I think was um, a place outside Jerusalem. It was like a rubbish tip, I believe. Um, and it was associated with fire uh, and um, uh, even sacrifices, that, that kind of thing. Uh, so we can take it from the Gospels. Uh, that there is this place um, and you know we can take from the doctrine of original sin a gk chesterton uh, called the only doctrine you can prove by opening the newspaper that uh, we we have a, a tendency uh, to separate ourselves from god now in the i think it was the 1960s there was a uh, a famous controversial book by Hans Urs von Balthasar, uh, and it was called Dare We Hope That All Will Be Saved. Uh, and it's this idea that we have to believe hell exists, but we don't have to believe there's anybody in it. Um, you might want to discuss that in the cells. Uh, there uh, are advocates for this position, Dare We Hope. Myself, I'm a, a more pessimistic sort. Uh, you know, I do uh, think there are some people who cut themselves off. Uh, as C.S. Lewis said, the door to hell is locked from the inside. Uh, but, but we as Christians have this hope that, um, you know, this great redemption is available to us. Uh, and we will be saved by faith, as St. Paul says. Um, and so it's this great uh, belief that uh, animates the churches belief uh, in this state of purgatory, uh, which is not shared by our, our fellow Christians, but for me is a, 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 a beautiful and um, uh, believable doctrine that flows from our belief in the operation of grace, uh, where we believe that our primary decision in our life, our faith in Christ, will save us. But there are many secondary decisions in our lives. Um, we're complicated. Uh, the, the line between good and evil runs through all of us. And, but this primary decision for Christ uh, is enough to save us. Uh, and the grace that's poured out, uh, you know, will purify us. But at the point of our death, our final decision, our primary decision is made and our final destination is, is fixed. But, not necessarily you know it doesn't take not necessarily how long it takes us to get there and so uh, i wanted to quote uh, uh something i found 
uh, that I thought summed it up from uh, a book by uh, Joseph Ratzinger, uh, where he says, Purgatory is not some kind of supraworldly concentration camp where man is forced to undergo punishment in a more or less arbitrary fashion. Rather, it is the inwardly necessary process of transformation in which a person becomes capable of Christ, capable of God, and thus capable of unity with the whole communion of saints. Simply to look at people with any degree of realism at all is to grasp the necessity of such a process. It does not replace grace by works, but allows the former to achieve its full victory precisely as grace. What actually saves is the full ascent of faith. But in most of us, that basic option is buried under a great deal of wood, hay and straw. Only with difficulty can it peer out from behind the lattice work of an egoism we're powerless to pull down with our own hands. Man is the recipient of the divine mercy, yet this does not exonerate him from the need to be transformed. Encounter with the Lord is this transformation. It is the fire that burns away our dross and reforms us to be vessels of eternal joy. Vessels of eternal joy uh, is what we're meant to be. And then this leads to the final point, um, this notion of heaven. Uh, we're all aware, I'm sure, that Jesus doesn't really refer to this concept of heaven, uh, except as to be where God lives, our Father who art in heaven. But for the rest of us, uh, he, he, he talks about the kingdom of God. The kingdom uh, is mentioned time and time again. So what does it mean, this, this notion of, uh, uh, of our final destination? Well, if you talk, if you, if you listen to um, the great uh, Ang Anglican uh, theologian N.T. Wright, he's very, uh, uh, hammers home the point that going to heaven is not really a Christian belief. He cites that belief in Plato, the Greek philosopher, who believed we have souls and when we die, our souls will be separated from our body and we and, and we'll go to heaven so nt wright would say that that is an unchristian an unbiblical uh, belief uh, and so it is um what instead he says and this is where i want to lead us through to advent and what i'd like us to do for advent uh, is to go to the end of the book of isaiah in the old testament uh, so Isaiah talks at the very beginning in, in chapter six about seeing God in heaven. It's this awesome sight. We get this, the holy, holy, holy of the mass. Uh, uh, holy, holy, holy uh, God of um, Lord God of armies uh, is what we see at the beginning. Uh, but at the end, the very end of Isaiah chapter 66, um, the, the prophet talks about God gathering all the nations. Uh, and in a new creation uh, and uh, he talks of a new heaven and a new earth and this is to be our destiny uh, with with the grace uh, and the the joy uh, that uh, god's transformation will uh, pour out for us a new heaven and a new earth so um i hope that's not too airy fairy uh, but what i would like us to do uh, when we come back in advent is we'd like to I'm going to think a little bit about the book of Isaiah uh, as we go through Advent. And we could we'd start maybe with the last few chapters. Um, it forms a little section from maybe 55 to 66. So um, if you uh, if you did want to turn your attention to that, uh, I think it would be uh, 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 time well spent for us uh, in Advent. Um, and so I will, uh, you know, finish by quoting from chapter 66. Uh, says the Lord, for as the new heavens and the new earth, which I will make, shall remain before me, said the Lord, so shall your descendants and your name remain. Uh, from new moon to new moon and from Sabbath to Sabbath, all flesh shall come to worship before me, says the Lord. So I hand it over to the cells for discussion about, uh, you know, the new heavens and the new earth that we will live in in the, in the new creation. Uh, and uh, I will bid you a, a, 
God bless until then. Uh, and uh, next time we will come back in Advent to discuss Isaiah.